Welcome to My Face, My Story, Voices from the Craniofacial Community, with your host, Dina Zuckerberg. Hello, and welcome to another episode of My Face, My Story, Voices from the Craniofacial Community. Whether you're watching on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, Click subscribe now so that you'll never miss a future episode. I'm your host, Dina Zuckerberg, the Director of Family Programs at MyFace. I was born with a cleft lip, a hearing loss, and no vision in my left eye. MyFace, my story is about people like us being seen and heard, about sharing stories within the craniofacial community and with others. For today's episode, I will be joined by Loretta Swift, an apparent activist and the CEO of Face Equality International, an NGO campaigning to end the discrimination and indignity experienced by the global facial difference community. After sustaining facial scars in a car accident in 2015, she set out to reshape the negative narratives that dictate the public perception of scars and disfigurements. She worked with Changing Faces UK, first as a volunteer, then as campaigns officer before being promoted to campaigns manager, where she worked on the I Am Not Your Villain campaign, along with leading a home office hate crime campaign and multiple face equality weeks. Her TEDx talk explores the harms caused by poor media representation in which facial differences are often associated with villains and vulnerable people on screen. Welcome, Felita. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Dina. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so excited to have you here today. Um, so can you take us back to 2015 when you were in a car accident in Ghana where you were going to be volunteering that summer? Yeah, sure. So um, I was in my second year of university. It was the summer between my second and third year. And I was supposed to be joining a friend um, volunteering in a school in Ghana. And on the first full day there, we were driving overnight um, to go on a weekend trip. And we collided with another vehicle. And the whole side of the minivan that I was on just basically crumbled in. Um, There are no ambulances in Ghana, there's no official police report to this day. Um, One of the people in the minivan had to flag down another car to kind of bundle us all in and take us to a hospital that had its lights off and they had to bang on the doors and get us all in. It Honestly, I could write a book. It was like, it was just, yeah, it feels like it happened to a different person now. It was hectic. Wow. That's crazy. Um, So how did that moment change your life and how did you find strength? I mean, I can't imagine being in that situation. Yeah, I mean, it changed my life, uh, I think, predominantly for the better. I am here. I have this opportunity to do something that I truly care about. But in the in the very kind of immediate aftermath, it was horrendous. Um, And people listening to this podcast um, from the craniofacial community will understand the nature of kind of surgeries. Um, so I had five surgeries, none of which were under general um, anesthetic. I was awake for all of them. Wow. Um, yes. Uh, for various reasons, including just kind of the pain meds that you get out in Ghana and all of that sort of stuff. So it was it was really difficult. I spent a lot of time recovering, not just from my facial injuries, but also from kind of various broken bones around my body. My parents kind of took me in and looked after me. Um, And then there was the emotional adjustment because I no longer looked like myself. I no longer looked like this 22 year old girl who, you know, was in university, going out drinking a lot, doing my makeup I now had these kind of two different sides of my face that I didn't really associate with me um so it was a massive massive adjustment one of the things that you said that uh, I think is really true and I've discovered this recently is that when so sometimes I'll go and speak at a school and, and a student will say do you wish it could have been different when you were growing up or easier 
And I, I say, because I think it's true that, yes, there are moments that I wish hadn't, that I didn't have to deal with. But then again, I feel as I wouldn't be the person I am today doing the work I'm doing if not for my experience growing up. And you said something similar, I think. So a hundred percent I would not I would not get rid of my scars I would not change it I absolutely embrace and love every part of my face um and it's really taught me a lot it's taught me about what matters in life um it's given me a sense of purpose I've built my entire career now around (laughs) facial Mm -hmm. difference um and it was it's kind of ironic because for so long I didn't want to let this moment in time um this perceived flaw to define me and I've literally based my entire life around it now (laughs) yes yeah but in some ways it's it's a part of who you are right it's not all of you and that's the other piece that I've learned exactly and it's really nice like my story is literally stamped across my face (laughs) right exactly exactly so I understand you went in search of organizations support groups after this happened to you and you found changing changing faces UK Did you find the support you were looking for and how did that help you? So interestingly, the support that I got was more from community. So more from meeting like-minded individuals. I was very reluctant um, to seek professional help. I don't know whether this was because it was back in 2015 and we've been on this massive kind of mental health type revolution in recent years where it's really destigmatized. I don't know whether it was just because I was naive um, or just being fierce and not wanting to kind of accept that I might need help. Um, mm-hmm. But I didn't I didn't at the time. I actually kind of just sought help through speaking to people with similar experiences and finding a sense of community, which in itself is a form of help. And I really, really found so much strength in that and I feel incredibly privileged to live in a country where that network where that charity did exist um, and where there are people fighting not just for equality but providing people with the support that we know the facial difference community needs. Absolutely so you took over for Dr James Partridge as the CEO of Face Equality International after his uh, untimely death in 2020 I had the pleasure of meeting James once years ago. He was an amazing man. Um, Can you talk about who he was and his life-changing work? Sure. So his full title is Dr. James Partridge, OBE. um, And he set up Changing Faces UK um, in 1992. Um, And they went on to provide kind of really innovative, pioneering psychosocial support, workshops, integrated kind of care within our national health service for people with any marked scar or condition affecting appearance. So not just kind of congenital conditions, things that people acquire like scars as well. Um, And then later, I think it was in perhaps 2008, they also launched the Face Equality campaign, recognizing that a huge number of the barriers that individuals face are societal they are attitudinal um, and that is where the face equality campaign comes in and that is where face equality international started but james was just an incredible man a burn survivor he was in a car accident when he was 18 years old so we have that shared experience um, and with significant scarring and years of surgery afterwards he was kind of reintegrating himself into a world where he was heavily kind of stigmatized and he had to really, really take it upon himself to have to do that work to manage social interactions um, and to manage other people's reactions. And that was what he realized is that there was a real gap in the market for this type of very unique care for this Mm -hmm. community that recognizes that it's not just kind of classic psycho, it's not just classic psychosocial support. It is very much about giving people life skills, kind of social skills, and it's not just about kind of mental health. Um, So he was an absolute pioneer and his legacy remains. And 
you just mention his name to anybody within this community and they they speak so fondly of him which is wonderful it's so true because i have talked about him and and exactly what you just said people know who he was so yeah uh so what is the mission of faith equality international today and how has it changed under your leadership yeah of course so we've definitely changed to some degree Um, just in terms of moving with the direction that our members want us to go in and also me putting a little bit of a personal stamp on things. So we've since um, very recently taken a human rights kind of based approach, a rights based approach for this community. And what we want to really do is position face equality as a social justice issue, um, recognising that this is an equality issue within its own right, Um, facial differences and identity, it's a human experience, it's a community, um, and it's one that often gets neglected, and it's one that doesn't often have space when it comes to other marginalised identities such as race, such as disability. It doesn't fit necessarily within those other groups, so we're about asserting that this is a social justice issue in its own right, um, and that's very much something that I've been wanting to really, really solidify um, and be crystal clear about. I think historically, we know that this falls within a health issue, a public health issue, but it shouldn't be limited to those spaces. Do you feel like you're making headway there? Uh... I will not stay, like there's there's, there's just constant stuff to be done. (laughs) I know, I know. And I think we are making change. So this year um, I spoke at the Human Rights Council at the United Nations um, and that was one of our strategic objectives from the very beginning was to get in front of the United Nations. So that was very cool and a real milestone moment and something that we absolutely want to do again. Great. So we have a question um, from one of our listeners. How does one become an appearance activist there's so much work that needs to be done. Big question. There is so much work that needs to be done. Gina, do you want to answer that one or is that one directly for me? Uh, I think it's directed to you. But well, I, I would say that yeah. the work that you do as well is absolutely relevant to this, but uh, it doesn't look one way. Um, and I say to people sometimes the level of um, exposure you want in terms of being an activist again doesn't look one way you can be super public with this stuff or you can actually just have conversations with individuals with your family with your friends it really really ranges from the very kind of day-to-day stuff right up to shouting from the rooftops um so i think the key thing is having these conversations and having these conversations in a way where you're opening people's minds, where you're providing resources for people to be educated, um, and also sharing your story to some degree is a great way to be an activist, but being very boundaried about how you share your story, because this is a kind of community that there's this voyeuristic nature, and this is where it goes into media representation. It's so often a very one-sided kind of picture of what facial difference is like and a huge part of activism is telling it how it is and being seen and heard on your own terms yes absolutely i will say i've been so i've been working at my face for a little over nine years and and i've watched this community uh, really come out and find their voice and really being much more out there than when I started nine years ago. And I'm just amazed. And it just makes me so happy to know that we are putting ourselves out there, finding our voices and using our voices to try to promote change in how people perceive people with facial differences. So yeah, it's been uh, exciting to watch this movement. So. Uh, before we go on, I just want to remind our audience members to feel free to ask for Mita any questions you might have using the live chat. So can you tell us about the I Am Not Your Villain campaign and do you feel we are making any inroads or is there still a lot more work to be done in this area? 
How have the TV and film industries responded to this campaign and has it led to any change? Um, so the I'm Not Your Villain campaign, I would say, in some ways, has been the most successful campaign that Changing Faces has ever run, in the sense that there's been quite a lot of backlash. Um, and you get people saying, this is just woke nonsense, you're all a bunch of snowflakes, can't you tell the difference between real life and make-believe? And it's my belief that that's a sign that we're really, really making change, that we're mm -hmm. reaching beyond this echo chamber of peace and that actually it's starting to get people thinking. Um, so the, yeah, the I Am Not Your Villain campaign is basically calling for greater, more holistic kind of representation of facial difference on screen. Um, and that goes from seeing people in a range of different roles. I think sometimes if you take the campaign at face value, you might think, okay, well, they want to ban any kind of even vaguely immoral characters who look different. And that's not the case. It's actually about having, the problem at the moment is that when you see someone with a scar with a facial difference in the media on screen, they're disproportionately negative characters and it right. plays in that stereotype of us being immoral, evil, not to be trusted, um, of us being victims. We want to see such a kind of a range of opportunities for this community and also for people to be playing themselves rather than the use of prosthetics as well. Right. So there's kind of an evolution of the campaign that's going on now and in terms of making real change, there are definitely kind of milestones. So the British Film Institute made a pledge to no longer fund films that were using this trope. Um, and we're seeing a bit more traction in the US as well. Um, there's still a lot to be done. I mean, just this past couple of months, we've seen so many new releases from House of Dragons to Hocus Pocus, um, all sorts of films that are continuing to do this. And I think Hollywood in particular seems to just be unreachable with mm. this conversation. We absolutely need to get in front of writers, producers, directors, the lot of them. So uh, to add to that, what if somebody is finds this objectionable or wants to, what would you recommend they do? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, so if somebody finds this objectionable and wants to do something because they just feel like they need to do something, what would you recommend they do? Is there anything we can do as members? As community members. Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing more and more people challenge this stuff when they see it. Um, I think that there's, you know, a great way to use social media it, and particularly Twitter, where there is like such active conversation mm -hmm. about films, where you can tag in all of the relevant producers, casting, like everybody, get on Twitter and shout about it and encourage everybody that you know to share it. And don't be afraid to kind of at people that are relevant to these decisions, because what's, what's really tricky is when you see how many people are involved in productions um, and the massive kind of operation that these things are and yet it's still been greenlit how many people could have just stuck their hand up and say oh this is a little bit problematic and offensive do you not think mm -hmm. we should rethink this right. decision and and it still gets greenlit and that was truth that was you know that was true of the witches film um that came out in recent years with Anne Hathaway again around Halloween and Warner Brothers and Anne Hathaway had to um, issue a public apology because it was so offensive to people with limb differences. Absolutely. So I know there's a level of stigma of shame attached to facial differences or disfigurements, especially in certain parts of the world. Uh, can you talk more about that? Sure. So we are in the early stages of embarking on a particular project at, at the moment that works in low and middle income countries. So Face Equality International is first and foremost an alliance of other organizations, charities like My Face um, that work together um, to campaign and to advocate. 
bearing in mind that there are lots of similarities with the global experience of facial difference, but it's very kind of culturally specific. So we're embarking on a stigma project, um, which will focus on some key geographical areas such as India and Africa, looking at the experiences of the community there, recognizing that from what limited uh, research that does exist, we see the most extreme cases of human rights violations, such as people being hidden away, banned from attending school, abandoned and left in bins. Um, we see those in low and middle income countries, such as India, Nepal, Ghana, um, where we know we need to be doing more work and we, we want to work in partnership with our members to understand the best, most culturally appropriate way to be campaigning um, as an alliance, recognizing that there's a huge amount of, um, what would you call it? There's a huge am amount of cultural influence um, that might say that uh, a facial difference is a mark of the devil, it's a mark of sin. There's a lot of stuff to try and unpack and it's not about us going in and saying that people's beliefs are wrong. Um, it's about working in communities to try and understand the root of the problem. I imagine also education is so important because they probably really believe what they believe, right? I mean, and and how do you change that? And I imagine education plays a role in that. It needs to, yeah, education needs to play a role, but it needs to come from very much grassroots efforts yeah. on the ground in the communities. It's not yeah. for us to say what the most appropriate way is. I think yeah. what we can do is act as a catalyst for our networks to be doing this work um, in line with their existing work. So where we've got member organisations delivering surgeries or they might be going out on um, surgical missions, they might be having community li liaison workers going out, having conversations with parents, with patients, um, and there is a huge amount that can be done to try and destigmatize you know, as a route to pre like reducing human rights violations, but also as a route to more patients coming forward to um, actually seek help as well. There are so mm -hmm. many people that do not seek help because the stigma and the shame is so severe. Yeah, it breaks my heart every time I hear about children being hidden away and not being able to go to school and not being able to show themselves because of their uh, facial difference. So I'm and this is what I mean to say by like the societal and the attitudinal barriers as well, which I don't, I just don't think on a global scale have been truly recognised. We are yeah. so fixated on the medical model that it's really, really inhibiting us from understanding. Okay, well, there is like there is no physical reason why this individual should be held back. Right, right. Well, I'm glad that uh, Face Equality International is is tackling this one because. I think it's a, it's a really important issue. We're not gonna we're not gonna fix stigma anytime soon. <laughs> no, no, no. But we at are. Least, we at are least you're trying to address it, so yeah. it's, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we are both fortunate to live in countries, you in the UK and I in the US, where we have access to healthcare. There are certainly parts of the world where individuals with facial differences or disfigurement are not as fortunate. What work are you doing in this area, if any? Yeah, so th this is very much the stigma project um, yeah. where FEI takes a social justice kind of approach. We, we are less focused on service delivery in terms of healthcare, but our member charities and we do work with a community that is providing healthcare. Um, and also we are very much interested in health inequalities um, in terms of global health. So we have a part to play in that kind of conversation, but it's not our core focus to ensure that people get medical intervention. So can you tell us about Face Equality Week, an international campaign, and what is this year's theme, if you know, and how can people get involved 
And what other plans do you have for the future to help raise consciousness about facial differences? I know that was a lot in one. <laughs> oh, if I forget one, please repeat it. Yeah. Um, so Face Equality Week, um, International Face Equality Week has been running now, gosh, how long? Since 2019. Um, mm -hmm. And it started in the UK just with Changing Faces. And then in, in Taiwan, I believe, um, that was in 2017. Um, so each year there is a theme and for us um the year before last was education last year was human rights i can't tell you what the theme is for this coming year because we don't actually know yet okay. we actually have our international our, like annual members conference next week where we've got a big um i few as we abbreviate it to um planning session so we'll know more then um, but it will tie in with our existing projects. So it's likely that stigma will come up in some way, shape or form. What was the other question? Oh, and how can people get involved? So they, can they go to the, your website to learn more? Yeah, exactly, you can. So I think the best way to do, to stay in, in, in like touch for updates is sign up to our newsletter, follow us on social media at Face Equality Int. Um, there will always be tools for community, for activists to get involved. We always send out a toolkit um, in the weeks running up to the campaign. So I guess stay tuned um, and we'll do our best to get plans out as soon as possible. Great. Yes, I uh, look forward to that every year and being involved in that uh, campaign. I think it's really important. So... How important do you think it is to find psychosocial support when coping with a difference? Yeah, I think this is a great um, example of where there are inequalities in all healthcare systems. There is a real lack of tailored support um, that's integrated into care pathways anywhere in the world, to be truth be told, um, despite tireless work of campaigners and not-for-profits to really embed this into people's care it has happened to some degree like here in the UK James our founder was instrumental in ensuring that psychosocial support was integrated into burn care here um so it is it is vital it is vital for someone to not you know have to rely upon a charity for example or to drop out of the system and then have to go in search of that support themselves I don't recall being offered psychosocial support myself right. it's very much about someone having to kind of go in search of it yeah. um or certain areas where perhaps i think particularly in cleft care here in the uk it is a bit better but it's very sporadic and it is incredibly yeah. important to have access to it and that's not to say that everybody needs it um right. but we need to have access to it and it needs to be tailored to the unique kind of needs and experiences of this community. It's very rare to see healthcare professionals, um, you know, psycho psychologists, um, psychotherapists with experience of, this isn't just a mental health thing. Right. It's, a, it's a social thing. It's an identity thing. Um, and it plays into every aspect of life. So people need to have very very specialist support um and that's just not yet really a reality anywhere in the world uh i do think there is still even a stigma around seeking psychosocial support in some ways um it's not something that people are willing to say or seek out sometimes and i think uh i do think that's changing some but I do think it's still hard for some people to do that. And also, I think, I know, I know for me over the years, especially when I was younger, I, I was I, I so wanted to fit in, not stand out. And for me, doing that was saying that I, I that in some ways that I was, that I needed it or that my difference um, was, I, I wanted to fit in. Yeah. Um, and I, as I've gotten older, I realize how incredibly important psychosocial support is, not just for me, but for the community that we work with, because 
when you meet others that have had similar journeys, it, it, it just it feels so uh, validating. All of a sudden, I'm not the only one that's had a, this experience. So I have grown to really understand how important it is over the years. Mm, finding a sense of community. And I think yeah. that sense of community is not just about sharing negative experiences. That sense of community comes from a really positive Absolutely. space as well, I believe. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to create at FBI is this community of activists with very, very different experiences, you know, not just everybody with the same condition even, um, but there is that shared understanding, there is that shared sense of purpose and yeah, peer support and community and networks are a great thing. Um, and we just wish that everybody had access to them. Mm -hmm. So Halloween is coming up. Uh, next week, I think. So for many in the cranial facial community, this can be a difficult day in which they are bullied or made to feel different. Uh, thank you for leading a campaign at Face Equality International to help educate the public and to challenge these harmful Halloween tropes. Why and how can we be more aware and do better, in your opinion? So with... Um with Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. So Halloween, we've actually got a campaign launching today in the net, like we're waiting on a final video to come from a creative agency, like right now, uh, that we're going to share in preparation for Halloween. And it's an educational piece. It's a conversation starter, basically, to recognize that it causes great distress for the community, seeing costumes, makeup that mimic and mock and use facial difference as a device to scare. Um, facial difference is not scary. And what hurts is that we keep telling young people to think that it's scary because that is essentially what Halloween is about. Similarly to villains with scars and facial differences, it's the, the harmful aspect of it is that it's a, it's a trope um, it's a false narrative that should have been eradicated by now um, because kids aren't born thinking that facial difference is scary. Right. Um, it's things like The Lion King that tell them that. That's why I've had kids say to me, my face is scary and they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we need to you know, have a collective responsibility to stop telling kids and future generations um, that this is okay, that it's okay to think that we're less than to bully. So we've got a campaign video coming out now that can hopefully everybody can get behind and they can share. It's going to go on TikTok um, and all of the other social platforms. Um, and beyond sharing it as well, I think similarly, if people want to share their own experiences, talking about this stuff really, really helps. Um, it helps us to combat some of the backlash as well that we see when people say, oh, well, it's just Halloween. Let us have right. fun. Come on. This is just a bit of harmless banter or this doesn't mean anything. And that's just not the case. You right. know, mental health wouldn't be such a kind of big issue in this community if we didn't have really, really harmful stereotypes out there. Um, it does have a real life impact when we see kids being bullied using the names of characters like Freddy Krueger as a taunt. Um, and I don't think we fully understand the weight of using our real life faces as costumes to invoke fear. Right. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think that, uh, it's all about, I guess, changing the narrative, right? And changing how we think about things and how we do things. So I uh, look forward to seeing this campaign that's coming out today, the video. And I will do my part to see what and how we can uh, get it out there. So thank you. Uh, the experience of someone who has acquired a facial difference at some point in their life differs from that of someone who's had a facial difference from birth, right? Uh, and so since it might lead to a change in their identity, 
what piece of advice or wisdom do you have for someone who has acquired a facial difference and possibly a change in their identity? Yeah, um, and this is something that I think about quite a lot in line with my work in time in terms of trying to understand and recognize there is not one size fits all. You can't assume that just a, an acquired facial difference is everybody's going to agree or everyone's going to have the same experience. Mm -hmm. And similarly with something you're born with, um, and I do try my best to try and understand that experience of being born with something as best as possible. And there is so much research out there about the fact that it is not about the quote unquote severity or the level of visible, like vis visibleness of a facial difference that does not compare, that does not correlate with the impact that it has on the individual. It could be something seemingly insignificant and not that visible to others, mm -hmm. but it has a profound impact on the individual. And I would say that to everybody, um, you know, coming to terms with acquiring a facial difference is that it is, there is no one size fits all. There is no mm -hmm. right or wrong way to try and kind of come to terms with this newfound appearance it is so deeply deeply personal but what really got me through was pouring all of my energy into doing um the things that made me feel like me when I was really struggling with my sense of identity in terms of the way that I was now looking you know I have a fringe cut in um I was like wearing heavier makeup I didn't wow. want to wear clothes again I was you know I had a brief moment in time where I tried to hide away right. and then I thought nah I'm not gonna right. do this right, right, um, right. and it was it was doing the things that made me feel like me and going out there and showing the world yeah this is me take me or leave me um difference or not that that kind of spite um, that lit a fire in me that wanted to prove the world wrong that really really is a constant source of I don't know constant source of, like that's that keeps me grounded um is wanting to prove people wrong and and not be seen as a as something someone to pity I, I hate right. the idea of someone looking down on me or feeling like I'm less of a woman or I would never feel confident because I have this kind of perceived flaw that is not associated with femininity or beauty. I, I absolutely want to prove people wrong and that drives me a lot. Yeah. Well, I will say that the facial difference community is lucky to have you um, uh, fighting this fight and educating oh, and changing uh, changing people's perceptions. So thank you. Um, so what kind of work do you think needs to be done to change the terminology around words like disfigurement or do we need to? And which words have negative connotations and which words do you believe are more neutral? So this is really interesting. And I would, again, <laughs> it's never a simple answer, is it? Right. Um, this causes so much division um, and so much time and energy is spent on this stuff and it holds us back. Mm -hmm. It is my utter belief that it, you know, we're already such a neglected space and we spend so much time and energy kind of like almost fighting with each other about, you know, kind of policing the right terminology. And I just think it's a waste of time and, you know, limited energy. Um, and actually, what I would love to see is people feeling, one, empowered to use whatever terminology they want, mm -hmm. to reclaim whatever terminology they want. Um, and I've forgotten what the second thing was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and no, that was it. And people, I'm not batting an eyelid about it and just saying, yeah, you do you. You use whatever language you want to use. Let's right. Like it, it makes no impact on me um, because it doesn't. You know, we see in so many other movements the reclaiming of previously derogatory words 
queer, for example, mm -hmm. um, it was used as a slur. And now that is such a thing to celebrate. So why not us celebrate the term disfigurement, which, yes, does have inherently negative connotations, but it is a word that adequately describes the, the disadvantage that comes in this current point in time living with a disfigurement. I will proudly say I have a disfigurement. And if we don't use that word, the sad thing is, is that people don't really know yet what facial difference means. Right. I would say that if you're unsure or if you don't have personal experience and you want a kind of safer word that you know won't kind of be contentious, by all means, facial difference, visible difference for something that is perhaps face and or body. But I absolutely would love for us all to just quit worrying about using the wrong terms and focus on the matter at hand is like the deep rooted systemic inequalities that are right. in society. <laughs> yeah, right. It is, it's a debate that's been going on uh, certainly ever since I've been at my face and, and it's always, we're always thinking about it. And you're right. It's, it's everybody, I guess, thinks of themselves differently. It's interesting because I've been thinking about the word disability and do I, because I have no hearing on my right side and we're hearing it in my left and I have no vision in my left eye, do I have a disability? And I never really thought of myself that way mm. uh, because it's always it's what I've always known. So it's a challenge for me, but it's, I don't feel like it, it necessarily inhibits me. Maybe it does in ways that I don't necessarily think about. Certainly did during the pandemic when everybody's wearing a mask. Yeah. But, I think about even just with that word, do I think, uh, do I have a disability or not? And some people say yes, and then others say no. So I think you're right. It, it really depends on the person and how they see themselves. And yeah, I probably don't similarly learning from other equality movements, like the, you know, we've both got our, pro our pronouns, like we, we, we understand the, the importance of self-identification. That's really important. Um, but yeah, I think what you've picked up on there rightly is the relationship between disfigurement and disability and that kind of dis that is, again, inherently negative. But both of those communities, also there is huge movements to really reclaiming those words. And yeah. it's not the language, it's not the word that's negative, it's the public perception of it. Right. Um, and there is not anything wrong. It's not a bad word um is my belief and I think if we reclaim them um and find that sense of community from them then it helps us to you know have the language that we need to reach the general public if we don't have the language to talk about this stuff then we're really going to hold ourselves back well uh, I agree 100% with that. And I think we are um, at the end of our conversation. And um, I want to thank you so much, Fulita, for sharing so much of yourself today and every day. And I am in awe of all that you are accomplishing and doing with Face Equality International and the work. So thank you. Thank you, Dina. Like the same goes back to you. I, I It's a thrill to be able to work with you. And um like we've like we've touched upon having that community around you is just vital um and that's utterly like that's completely what fei is it's it's building a community of people that are kind of fighting for this stuff so it's an honor and um i love chatting to you as always thank you thank you uh so everyone uh has a story and i'm hopeful that by sharing stories like for leaders today, we can help create a kinder world. Thank you again. Our community is lucky to have such incredible advocates like you. Um, for more than 70 years, my face has been dedicated to changing the faces and transforming the lives of children and adults with facial differences by providing access to holistic, comprehensive care, education, resources, and support that pave the way for better outcomes. To learn more, please visit myface.org. If you would like to learn more about the MyFace support groups so that you can connect with others in the cranial facial community, please visit myface.org slash online groups. If you haven't already, 
Be sure to subscribe to the My Faces YouTube to catch future live broadcasts of My Face, My Story. You can also listen to the audio recording of your favorite podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to receive email reminders of new episodes, sign up at myface.org slash mystory. That's myface.org slash mystory. Thank you for joining us for this episode of My Face, My Story, and I hope you will join us for the next episode in November, where we will have a conversation with Rick Guidotti, the founder of Positive Exposure, and Naomi Levenstein, makeup artist and craft advocate. We will discuss how we can redefine beauty to be more inclusive. That's it for today's episode of My Face, My Story. But remember, it takes courage to share your story. So be brave and speak out. Hi, I'm Stephanie Paul, the Executive Director of MyFace. MyFace is a nonprofit organization dedicated to changing the faces and transforming the lives of children and adults with facial differences. We do this through various programs and events, such as the Transforming Lives Educational Webinar Series, Races for Faces, The Wonder Project, and the groundbreaking MyFace My Story Conversational Series. You can learn more about all of these on our website at myface.org. If you enjoyed today's program, we hope you'll consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible, as well as to further the support of the craniofacial community. Thank you.